thought Kathy had decided I was uh, going to be replaced and she was going to do the message. <laughs> they won't let you, okay. So a couple of weeks ago when I spoke, uh, right in the middle of it, I, I thought about a sermon I had given when I first got out of uh, seminary. And I said, you know what, I, that's, a, that's a good message for a future day. And today is that day. Okay. Good morning, Heritage. Good morning. Let's pray that the message that I speak this morning is one given to me by God and not one given by myself to God. Amen? Amen. It's called the parable of the life-saving station, and, and if you've been in church for any number of years, you may have heard this one before, and each pastor tends to put his own uh, twist to it or direction to it, so if you've heard it, don't go to sleep, because it may remind you of something you need to tell someone else, right? Mark 16, verses... 15 and 16 says, Then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And like I said, I mentioned to you that I was going to preach this sermon at some point in the future. Um, but some of you may know, and, and if you don't, I'll tell you again, I was in the Navy. Spent a lot of time on the water. A lot of time on the water. Um, I'm actually old enough to have been on the last ship to leave the Tonkin Gulf. People you meet in Pahrump. Typically when our ship left a port, I would stand on the fantail. And to those of you who don't know Navy terminology, the fantail is the back end of the ship. And I would wave goodbye. So technically, I guess that makes me last man out, right? <laughs> During my time in the service, I heard this story, and I've heard it in various iterations, let's say. Uh, some of which can be repeated in the church, some which cannot. I'm going to repeat the one that can be. It's called the captain. It says, left on a sinking ship, there were the captain and three sailors. The captain spoke first. He said, men, this business about a captain going down with the ship is nonsense. There's a three-man lifeboat and I'm going to be in it to see who will come with me I will ask each of you a question the one who can't answer will stay behind here's the first question what unsinkable ship went down when it hit an iceberg first sailor said the Titanic sir he said okay get on on to the next question. How many people perished? The second sailor said, 1,517, sir. He said, here's the third question. And he turned to the third sailor and said, what were their names? Oh. <laughs> Guess that guy didn't make it. My, my sermon today um, comes from a story taken from a book called Personal Evangelism 101. It's by a gentleman named Brent Butler. I, I learned something. Johnny, I don't think you were in that class, but I think Billy was, where we were taught if you ever use something, you should let people know that it's not your thought. Because if you 
do it as if it's your thought. That's called plagiarism, and we all know people who have gotten in trouble for plagiarism. So I use things by other people, and I tell you I've used them by other people. If they're not uh, stories that we know who wrote them, I always attribute them to that great Greek philosopher, Anonymous. But our story today says, on a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept constant watch over the sea, and with no thought for themselves, they went out day or night tirelessly searching for the lost. Many lives were saved by this wonderful little station so that it became famous. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding areas wanted to become associated with the station and give of their time and money and effort to support its work. New boats were bought and new crews were raised. The Little Life Station grew. Some of the new members of the Life Saving Station were unhappy that the building was so crude and so poorly equipped. They felt a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge for those saved from the sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in an enlarged building. Soon, the life-saving station became a popular gathering spot for its members, and they redecorated it beautifully and furnished it as a sort of club. Less of the members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The mission of the life-saving station was still given lip service, but most members were too busy or lacked the necessity or the necessary commitment to take part in life-saving activities personally. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick and some had skin of a different color. Some spoke a strange language, and the beautiful new club was considerably messed up. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwrecks could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities as being unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal pattern of the club. But some members insisted that life-saving was their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told if they wanted to save the lives of all various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in these waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. They did. And as the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that occurred in the old station. They evolved into a club and yet another life-saving station was founded. If you visit that coast today, you'll find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, but now most of those people drown. As you consider this story, 
The mission of the church is somewhat similar to that of a life-saving station. With the passing of time, some churches have lost sight of their original purpose, and they gradually evolve into something different than what Christ intended when he said, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I love to ask questions. So my first question is, what is the mission of the church? Isn't it to bring to light the gospel of God and to proclaim the praises of God? Now, to bring to light the gospel of God, Paul said this about his mission as an apostle in Ephesians 3. He said, this grace was given to me, the least of all saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of all the Messiah and to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Paul was given grace to proclaim the Messiah. He did this as a functioning member of the church. What he's saying is that without the help of God, he would never be able to do God's work. Right now, we need to call on God's power to help us to do what he has planned for us. Next question, what is it that God has planned? In Ephesians, it says that the primary purpose is to make known the wisdom of God. Ephesians 3 says, this is so God's multifaceted wisdom may be known or made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. This is according to his eternal purpose accomplished in the Messiah, Jesus our Lord. You know, the, the mission of the church now is no different than was the mission of Christ to save sinners. First Timothy, Paul says, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. Jesus came preaching the gospel to lost and dying sinners, Therefore, as Mark 16 says, he wants the gospel to be made known to every person. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Too many times we make the mistake, and maybe not consciously or purposely, but we make the mistake of deciding who is deserving for us to bring that message to. Forgive us, Lord. Second mission of the church is to proclaim the praises of God. First Peter 2 says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession so that you may proclaim the praises of the one. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Some of you know I, I like to study a little bit when I prepare my sermons. So I read Henry's commentary, and if you don't know what that is, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But Henry's commentary um, had this to say about this verse. Christ never intended his gospel should be spread by fire or sword or his righteousness by the wrath of man. I could preach a whole sermon on just that one sentence. But I'm not. I don't have time. Got to get to lunch, right? Henry also said, but let the high praises of God be in our mouths. While we wield the sword of the word of God with the shield of faith in warfare with the world, the flesh, and the devil, the saints shall be more than conquerors over the enemies of their souls through the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony. The completing of this will be in the judgment of the great day. Continuously proclaiming the gospel of Christ is how we complete our mission. You see, our mission as the church, as the people of God, is a glorious mission. To proclaim the praises of God, which we do by lovingly, let me say that again, which we do by lovingly bringing to light the gospel of God. When you come at people through hate and scorn and degradation, you're not gonna hear anything you have to say. Not gonna hear it. You know, there's a song we like to sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus, because he first loved me. We, we love to sing that song. Maybe the people who need to hear about Jesus who haven't, you need to think about that song because maybe they will hear you if you first love them like Jesus first loved you. Where was I? Lovingly bringing the light of the gospel. But consider this. We, we fail our mission through misplaced emphasis. By placing emphasis on the material rather than the spiritual aspects of the church, the church loses its way. The church in Laodicea experienced this problem. Look at what it says in Revelation 3. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing, and you don't know that you are wretched, pitiful, blind, and naked. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be committed and repent. If you get a chance, go to Google Maps and look up Laodicea. From the satellite looking down, the spot at which that church was, if you look in the surrounding area, it's very green. But there's a big brown area even till today. Don't trust me, look it up. Look it up. Too many of today's Christians speak from a self-perceived position of superiority to those who may not know the gospel, thereby turning them away rather than toward Jesus. How many of you, when you were growing up and were being chastised by your parents, heard this from them after they had something to say to you that you didn't want to hear? You better get that look off your face. <laughs> Why? 
We need to be careful that when we're delivering the message to someone that we think needs to bring themselves closer to Christ, that we don't have that look on our face. Amen? See, that, that's one of the problems often experienced by churches today. Evidenced by the time and energy spent on the physical aspects of the church, the, the building, compared to the time spent fulfilling the true mission of the church, not just that physical needs shouldn't be met, but that the emphasis should be on getting the message out rather than on the upkeep of the facilities. I'm sorry if I'm stepping on toes here, but something is wrong if we get more worked up over the lack of air conditioning rather than over saving lost souls. When the business meeting of the church spends more time on physical matters rather than on spiritual matters. Isn't that the true business of the church? You know, I've been, I've been thinking, praying, on becoming pastor here. But some of my concerns are about changing who you as a church are, about you being pulled away from what you are, wanting to hear multiple voices speaking and leading, whether to stay small or wanting to grow larger. These are all the different concerns I've heard since I've been in attendance. No judgment. Not saying any or all of you are right or wrong. Just asking, are you like the church in Laodicea? If so, would you be better off materially poor and spiritually rich, like the church in Smyrna? It says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Read Revelations, the part that talks about the seven churches, and see if you see some of those things of each of the churches in church here. All churches have some of those things. It's not a judgment. In fact, if you find the perfect church, come let me know, because I want to stay away from it. You know, another way our mission as a church fails is by showing preference in our efforts to saving souls. God wants all to be saved. First Timothy. This is good. And it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Christ Jesus himself human who gave himself a ransom for all. Next, uh, next scripture. Here you go. You need to see it. If you hear it and see it and speak it, chances are it's going to stick. Verse 6 says, who gave himself a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. Jesus wanted everyone to be saved. Acts 10 says, God is no respecter of persons, nor shall it be. Peter said to them, you know, it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate or visit a foreigner. But God has shown me that I must not call any person common or unclean. 
That's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So I ask, why did you send for me? Peter began to speak. Now I really understand that God doesn't show favoritism. But in every nation, the person who fears him and does righteousness is acceptable to him. Luke 5, it says Jesus replied to him, the healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. These scriptures say that we should not show preference on the basis of a social distinction, a race, a lifestyle. James said, my brothers, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For example, a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes and a poor man dressed in dirty clothes also comes in. If you look with favor on the man wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, stand over there, or sit here on the floor on my footstool, haven't you discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Indeed, if you keep the royal law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. You ever stop to think about that? It's a sin to show favoritism? We need to be careful, people. You need to get in your Bible, read your scriptures, and find things like this that tell you when you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, even if you're doing it out of, forgive this word, but the, the dictionary description of ignorance, the absence of knowledge, not stupidity. There's a difference. There's ignorance and there's stupidity. Ignorance means you just don't know. And if you don't read your Bible, you don't know what you don't know. That great philosopher Christopher Wallace say, and if you don't know, now you know. <laughs> yeah, you got to Google Christopher Wallace. We need to ask ourselves, are we selective in sharing the gospel or do we try to preach the gospel to every creature? Mark 16, go into the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Let me conclude with these final thoughts. I heard somebody's stomach growling. <laughs> We've been given a noble mission, amen? One that warrants a frequent reminder and one worthy of being stirred up from time to time. What kind of life-saving station are we? Are we one that is faithfully fulfilling its mission, or are we one that is basking in its heritage, no pun intended, and former reputation? Let the parable of the life-saving station remind us of the folly of being the latter. Hebrews 10 says, let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. May God's grace and mercy shown toward us compel us to be active in sharing the same grace and mercy to others.
This we can do by proclaiming the gospel of Christ. I love to say we need to go out and spread the gospel and sometimes even use our words. Mark 16, verse 15. Then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Let's stand.